Hello, this is Dave Lee Travis, and welcome to this week's Top 10 Auto Show. This week, we're looking at the top 10 recreational off-roaders of 2001. Now, it's the old 4x4 cliche, but it's true to say the closest most of these soft roaders will actually get to being off-road is when they're jacked up to change a tyre. They are status symbols, luxury forms of transport, which give the owner the peace of mind that it could go off-road if they dared to get it dirty. At number 10 is the first of the Japanese vehicles in our top 10, the Suzuki Grand Vitara. The idea of the Suzuki Grand Vitara as a very capable off-roader used to make the likes of Land Rover laugh with hysterics, but that was long ago. You tend to think of Suzuki as a relative newcomer to the 4x4 market, but in fact they've been making vehicles like this for over 30 years now. I remember the original being launched, the SJ and LJ, very basic, tiny little engine vehicles that uh, people like Land Rover laughed at and said you couldn't possibly market a lightweight Jeep like that. But it wasn't long before Suzuki reinvented themselves as the ultimate fashion accessory and little white Jeeps with elephants on their rear wheel covers soon seen all over town. The car is easy to drive, and the controls are very ergonomically placed. But like many in the Suzuki range, the interior fabrics and plastics are pretty poor quality. Also on the negative list is the lack of standard equipment. Even the top specification models do not come with air conditioning, which is very much a must these days. But what about power? A few years ago, the insurance industry decided that uh, GTIs weren't worth the risk, and the insurance premiums went sky high. As a result, lots of people switched to these little 4x4s. Well, with this 142 brake horsepower engine, it's more like a four-wheel drive GTI than anything else I've driven lately. This car really makes a fashion statement, but is also an extremely competent off-roader. The Suzuki Grand Vitara. In at number nine is the soft roader from Korea, the Hyundai Santa Fe. Hyundai had a rebadged Mitsubishi as its only 4x4 until this came along, their very own, the Santa Fe. Now, even though Hyundai are pitching the Santa Fe to compete with the likes of the RAV4 and the Freelander, its size puts it more in between the Freelander and the Discovery, so straight away it's got an advantage on its competitors. It really is very spacious in here and there's enough room to sit five adults very comfortably and the boot is absolutely enormous. It hasn't taken long for the manufacturers to realise that there is a distinctive separate market to that of the serious off-roader. The Santa Fe screams fashion statement from its soft curves to its lifestyle styling inside. Taking into account that this type of off-roader will spend most of its time on the road rather than off it, you need to know that your recreational vehicle can perform on the tarmac. There's full-time four-wheel drive and a four-speed automatic gearbox designed by Porsche nonetheless, and that makes for a very stable and firm ride. Cracks and potholes in the road make no difference to the Santa Fe, and that V6 engine is very quiet and again, super smooth. In fact, it's more like driving a big saloon car. Now, saloon car drivers will notice a little bit more body roll when you drive one of these vehicles, but it's nothing too alarming, and even on some of the sharper corners, you never feel that the car is going to lose its composure or you're going to end up in the field. This Korean car really has a lot going for it, especially value for money. Every model has twin airbags, electric windows, alloys, and air conditioning as standard. The engine choice was originally between the petrol 2.4 and the 2.7 V6, but now that the Koreans realize that we Europeans appreciate the diesel option, they've added it to the list. At number eight, the new Maverick from Ford. Called the Escape in America, this new lifestyle vehicle for the off-road market really hits all the buttons. It has a tough, sporty appearance, huge space inside, and it's easy to drive. What more do you want? Well, what about performance? 
The most direct comparison is going to be with the Vauxhall Frontera. Mm. It's been a shadow when I mention it. So they've got to answer to the impressive Frontera V6, and they have with this 3-litre V6. It's basically a bored out and enlarged version of the 2.5-litre Duratec familiar to Mondeo owners. There is a 2-litre option as well. This one will dash from 0 to 60 in about 10 and a half seconds and onto a top speed of 118. Not much, but it's actually quite respectable for a car in this sector. The automatic gearbox, however, is only four speed, and the V6 has an American style column mounted shift, which is very annoying for European drivers who are not used to it. Reach for the indicator stalk, and unless your wits are about you, you could find your gearbox flicked into neutral. So, for the real test for a recreational off roader, what's it like on the road? Every time a new 4x4 is launched, whoever makes it, the manufacturer will say, oh, it drives just like a car. Well, it doesn't. They never do. It's a 4x4. It's tall. It's got longer suspension. It's got huge unsprung weight with the extra transmission. But, in the case of the Maverick, it's not far off. It's not at all bad. Big wobbly monster, it isn't. OK, then. What about off the road? Like it matters. All right, so it's hardly crossing the Andes, but this is about as rough as it's likely to get for one of these cars. Maybe romping across a field to find the best picnic spot. So this is probably a fair enough test. It's hardly a mud plugger's dream, but it's got the basics to get you out of trouble. Ordinarily on the road, the drive is delivered to the front wheels. But if you are getting off-road and you detect a bit of slippage, power will be transferred to the rear. Alternately, you can do it yourself manually by switching to permanent 4x4. Overall, though, the new Ford Maverick is a very impressive package and it has scored well against some very stiff opposition. This year's number seven is the Honda CRV. Think of it as a tough family estate. It does drive like a normal car, although its height gives it a bit of body roll on corners. It's very practical with plenty of interior space and little cubby holes everywhere. There's even a boot floor which doubles as a picnic table. This really tells you the market the Honda's aimed at. The Honda CRV is easy to drive with height steering and a peppy two litre engine, offering 145 brake horsepower. The Honda offers greater value for money considering that all three trim levels offer gear-like air conditioning as part of the standard list, an excellent and capable soft off-roader. At number six is a Japanese off-roader that started life in the US. It's the Nissan X-Trail. The Nissan X-Trail is yet another in this expanding category of vehicles. Launched in America before it came to Europe, this Nissan will create plenty of waves in the market here. I'm seriously impressed by the interior of the X-Trail. Nissan are really trying hard to shake off their old dull and bland interior. And this is another big step forward. Like any other off-roader, buyers will want to know how comfortable it is on the road. The reality is, of course, that the majority of buyers of the X-Trail will spend an awful lot of time on motorways and clogged up city roads. And the good news is, it's a very impressive performer. Two-litre engines, very smooth and quiet. The gearbox is slick and refined. You have the usual high seating position of a 4x4, and it's an altogether very relaxing experience. What could the self-respecting 4x4 owner ask for? Oh yes, what's it like off-road? I'm about to go down the side of what looks like a small mountain full of mud. This is the off-road course to see whether the X-Trail likes it off the trail. Let's have a little see.
At number five, the lifestyle off-roader from Land Rover, the Freelander. Even though there may have been some raised eyebrows in the Land Rover boardroom when it was announced they were to produce a lifestyle off-roader, the Freelander has been an astonishing success right across Europe. This really is a great little 4x4 with high build quality and recent styling tweaks giving it stunning modern looks outside and in. Now the interior on the early Freelanders was a little bit suspect, very plasticky, but the revisions made last year have gone some way to improving that. It all feels that little bit more refined now, better put together, and the materials feel quite solid and quite expensive. Not too keen on the colour scheme, but something like that you could live with. Of course, the Land Rover badge has given this soft road of the credibility which other manufacturers would have killed for, but it's more than just kudos. It's a highly practical, well-designed, solid off-roader. Another area that's really surprised me on the Freelander is the amount of cabin space. It's extremely roomy, and if you got in blindfolded, well, you'd swear you were driving a Discovery. I hope you take the blindfold off before you start driving, though. And uh, talking of driving, how is it behind the wheel? We know the Freelander performs extremely well off-road. In fact, it's the leader in its class. For this particular one I'm driving today, like the Santa Fe, it's got a V6, only this time 2.5 litres, and it's taken straight from the Rover 75. And it gives the car a whole new sense of urgency. 0 to 60 takes just 10 seconds, and your top speed, again, 113 miles an hour. But that engine package, you do really have to push it hard to get the performance. And of course, your fuel consumption is going to suffer, and it brings it down to about 23 miles to the gallon. Hello, this is Dave Lee Travis, and welcome to this week's Top 10 Auto Show. This week, we're looking at the Top 10 Recreational Off-Roaders of 2001. At number 4, the A6 Avant takes to the hills in the guise of the Audi All-Road. Sometimes, car companies move in mysterious ways. Surely common sense would tell you that an off-road vehicle is designed for the rough and tumble of rocks, boulders, sharp twigs and loads of mud. So who in their right minds would take an executive motorway cruiser like the A6 through this sort of treatment and ruin it on some godforsaken wasteland? But that's exactly what Audi did when they designed the all-road. Audi's interiors can hold their head up in any company. I rate them as amongst the very best in the world. So it's good news there's no disappointment in here. It's every bit an A6 Avant. Beautiful, clean, sharp lines everywhere. And every single bit made of, of the best quality materials and fitted beautifully. There's no stray lines or big gaps. There's all the usual kit you'd expect to find on board. We've got sophisticated satellite navigation, electrical everything, including my seat. Sounds very nice, but how can you expect us to believe that such a luxurious car can cope off-road? Because... When Audi named it the All-Road, they did so with good reason. It's suitable for all roads, and that's not just because it has the Quattro four-wheel drive system. It also has a very clever air suspension system, which allows it to vary the ride height according to the conditions. Let me explain and demonstrate. Right now, we're at normal. About there, for ordinary day-to-day -day driving around town. If you go over 75 miles an hour or press the button to lower it, it automatically drops to its lower position, streamlined for going really fast. If you want to go a bit off-road, you hit the button, you go up, past normal, and onto high one. We've got a bit of extra ground clearance, so we don't catch anything underneath. Fine. If it gets really tough, well, we can hit the button again, and we go up to high two. We're really high up. Nothing can catch us, and we're safe. That's the theory. That's just me jumping up and down. Don't know how it works in the car. So we'll try it, and we'll try it on all roads. The Audi A6 is a brilliant road car for the driver who needs off-road capabilities, but who will want to get such a beautiful car that dirty? And so, on to our top three recreational off-roaders, and at number three, another offering from the Far East, the Toyota RAV4. The RAV4 really was one of the pioneers of this type of vehicle. Toyota wanted to bring out a 4x4 with chunky looks that was as good to drive as a family car, and they succeeded. Although early models had very tinny bodies, the latest version of the RAV4 is much improved with greater room and an even better drive. 
If I've learned just one thing in my time with the Toyota RAV4, it's to bury some of my prejudice against soft rotors. Because yeah, they do get a bit of a rough press sometimes. But when you just need a car to get you and friends or family from one place to another with all their kit, they start to make an awful lot of sense. There's actually been loads of times when I've had some pretty exotic cars lurking about on the drive. But just to make a trip into town, I've reached the keys for this, the RAV4, just because it's so easy. There's even the diesel option now, which Far Eastern companies are kicking themselves that they didn't offer Europe ages ago. You get a great list on the standard equipment up front, and the whole package is quite economic to own and drive. It's strange to think that it's only been about eight years since this car's been on the market, and now there are so many pretenders on the road and occasionally off it. At number two, pip to the post for the top spot, the Volvo Cross Country. When the first generation Cross Country was introduced in 1997, it looked very similar to the V70 on which it was based. Sure, it was a bit beefier, but really it was an adapted estate. And it still looked like a beefed up estate. So Glenda Mackay took it off-road to see if it really was a 4x4 underneath. I am driving a car that you'd normally take all the kids in through a really big pit of water and it's fine. It's so fine. Normally when I'm on their roads like this, it's in the uh, co-driving seat of a rally car and it's going Rah! really, really loud and you can't hear yourself think. So almost top marks off-road, but this has required some compromises on-road. The V70 is a solid drive on the road, as you would imagine from a car like this, but surprisingly, when you're going around the corners, it's ever so light. The steering is light and it tends to wallow a bit. In fact, it oversteers slightly when you're on a road like this. And when I first got in the car, it was ever so slightly unnerving. Yeah, it feels solid, but it's all a bit wibbly wobbly on the top. I was speaking to one of the guys from Volvo earlier on, and he said that they've had to kind of compromise on the stability of the car when it goes around the corners to get it right when it's off-road. And I agree with him there. As usual for Volvo, this car is brimming with safety equipment. An excellent, solid vehicle, supremely practical, but it's at a price. So, before we look at the number one recreational off-roader of 2001, let's take a look at the top ten so far from ten to two. In at number 10 is the fashion statement from the Far East, the Suzuki Grand Vitara. At number 9, it's no longer just a rebadged Mitsubishi, it's the new Hyundai Santa Fe. At number 8, this one's not a Tirano either, it's the new Ford Maverick. Romping in at number 7, another one from the land of the rising sun, the Honda CRV. At number 6, and another from our friends in Japan, the Nissan X Trail. Down two places from last year at number five, the eyebrows are no longer raised, the Land Rover Freelander. Holding the same position at number four, is it an off-roader or is it an executive car? No, it's the Audi All-Road. Up three places at number three, one of the pioneers of the soft roader, the Toyota RAV4. And up a massive five places at number two, all the way from Sweden, the Volvo Cross Country. And so to our number one recreational off-roader of 2001. At the top spot for two years running, the BMW X5. So what is an X5? Well, take the 5 from the Super Saloon, the BMW 5 Series and the X for cross country, and there you have it, the BMW X5. Like the Volvo Cross Country, the X5 looks like a beefed up estate. So what's it got to make this 4x4 worthy of the top spot? The interior, as you'd expect from a BMW, is extremely civilised. The instrument panel doesn't favour the driver, so that one's passenger can take care of the stereo, the air conditioning and that satellite navigation thing. Everything is superbly positioned and, of course, it's all superb quality. And there are no complaints about the driving position either. In fact, these seats are more comfortable than the sofa in my living room. There's plenty of room for the driver, for the passengers, and for the most important bit of all, the shopping. Watch that credit card bill, Ginny. 
Out on the road, well, it might be a large, powerful vehicle, but it's surprisingly easy to drive. The extra height means you get a great view of everything around you. But it doesn't come with any of the rock and roll that you normally associate with off-roaders. And the performance from that V8 engine also reflects that. 0 to 60 takes just 7.5 seconds, and it easily cruises to a top speed of 128 miles per hour. It almost seems a shame to take this luxurious and expensive BMW off-road, but if you're buying an off-roader, you need to know it can go off-road. So how well does the X5 do? Now, because of BMW's connection with Land Rover, it will be no surprise to you to discover that quite a few of their gadgets and gizmos are on the X5. I'm talking about things like hill descent control. Now, this system, rather unsurprisingly, controls the engine's speed when you're on a very steep slope. It allows it to creep down at a steady six miles per hour. All you do is flick a switch just down here. You let the engine do the work for you. You don't panic. You don't even need to use your feet. So there you have it, the BMW X5, the number one recreational off-roader of 2001, as voted for by our panel of automotive experts from the top auto magazines, and by a big margin too. Looks like BMW have learnt a thing or two through owning Land Rover. This is Dave Lee Travis saying thanks for watching. See you next week for the top 10 hatchbacks of 2001. See you then.